The Star Trek universe has a question that hasn't been answered in 50 years. On screen, Lieutenant. What exactly happened between the Vulcans and the Romulans? I'm sure you are familiar with the ancient history of my people. Before we found logic, before we Vulcan, found Vulcan, like Earth, had its aggressive, colonizing period. And if the Romulans retained this martial philosophy, then weakness is something... We Reunification, can. after so many centuries. After so many fundamental differences have evolved between you... And if the Romulans are an offshoot of my Vulcan blood, and I think this likely, then attack becomes even more imperative. In the late 1990s, when fans had been waiting for decades for an answer, they learned that the mystery was going to be resolved in an adventure game. One that promised, with the help of some big names, to finally explore the backstory of two of the most important races in the franchise. But the resolution never came. For fans, who believed the game was almost complete, its cancellation was both disappointing and incomprehensible. On this episode of Retro Histories, we try to find the truth behind one of Star Trek's biggest secrets. Our story begins in 1983 in California, with the creation of Interplay Productions. Founded by a small group of designers and programmers whose employer had decided to stop making computer games and start making dry erase boards, their beginnings were humble, working for anyone who would pay them. But under the leadership of founder Brian Fargo, they soon started to release titles under their own name, and over the next decade, creating hits like The Bard's Tale, Battle Chess, and Wasteland, and publishing titles for the likes of Delphine, Maxis, and Blizzard, they grew into a multi-million dollar business, with hundreds of employees spread across several buildings, housing teams like Black Isle, 14 Degrees East, VR Sports, Flatcat, and the team behind Vulcan Fury, Tribal Dreams. In 1992 and 93, Interplay released two adventure games for the PC, Star Trek 25th Anniversary, and Judgment Rights. The games were praised for their faithfulness to the source material, and are among the first great uses of the Star Trek license. Although their biggest impact on pop culture was a moment that didn't appear in either game. Spock, open the outer door. Spock, sabotage the system. Okay, we have line 193 again with uh, sab sabotage and uh, sabotage. I don't say sabotage. You say sabotage. I say sabotage. I say sabotage. 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 Oh, please don't tell me how to do it. It sickens me. Uh, please don't hug me. It sickens me. Uh, please don't correct me. It sickens me. With enemies, you know where they stand, but with neutrals, who knows? It sickens me. Uh. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that in the 1990s, if you wanted a Star Trek adventure game, Interplay were your guys. So when in 1997 they announced at E3 that they'd been working on a third Star Trek adventure, one much more technologically and narratively ambitious, people were interested. And when they revealed that DC Fontana was involved, it really got fans' attention. You see, Dorothy Fontana had written more episodes of the original series than anyone but Gene Roddenberry and Gene Kuhn. The promise of a game voiced by the original cast with a story by Fontana and fellow original series writer John Meredith Lucas was the closest thing to a revival. It would tell the story of a long-lost weapon of mass destruction named Fury, once used by the Vulcans against the Romulans to end their brutal war, and the weapon's rediscovery by Romulans who, using peace talks as a pretense, intend to use it. The game would be split into chapters, each one a self-contained episode featuring different members of the crew. But the developers' ambitions didn't end at the script. Unlike Interplay's previous Star Trek adventures, the secret of Vulcan Fury was to be realized using pre-rendered 3D animated video. The idea of 3D animation wasn't new of course, but going this far was unprecedented. The team would attempt realistic human character animation. Characters' lips would sync to dialogue, and the digital actors would show believable emotions. And this wasn't just for a few cutscenes either. The entire game would be made this way. This was a big deal, and it would require some innovative production techniques. 
To create these realistic digital actors, Interplay took headcasts from staff members and then laser scanned them to produce 3D models. The principal actor's 1960s likenesses were sculpted life-size and then scanned by the same method. It was a costly and time-consuming process. Once inside the computer, these 3D models were animated based on video recordings of the actors. Early in the project, in the absence of a recorded script, animators practiced recreating scenes from the TV series, trying to capture every nuance of facial expression. Just as we are. You can't tell me what it is. Let's use reverse logic. Perhaps it'll help if you tell me what it isn't. Interplay also used a motion capture studio to record naturalistic body movements for characters. At the time, an expensive and technically difficult process. And of course, every prop, location, and piece of scenery that appeared in the game had to be modelled as well. There was a lot of hard work going on, but producing even a single finished shot required a huge amount of labour, and progress was slow. While this was happening, Interplay's marketing department also had their hands full. An author was commissioned to write the official hint book, a promotional deal was signed with a serial company, with boxes carrying a Vulcan Fury competition, and a release date was advertised, November 1997, just five months after the game's initial reveal. Interplay was acting like the game was almost finished, but in reality, all they really had was a five-minute non-playable demo that looked like this. Evidently, somewhere inside the company, something wasn't quite connecting. The truth is, although these years seem like a golden age for Interplay, they were releasing some of their most beloved games, their financial situation was increasingly grim. Big titles were underperforming, their tendency to miss release dates had cut into their profits, and the PlayStation had opened up a big new market that they had tried and failed to penetrate. Their 1997 losses amounted to $14.4 million. The following year, that number doubled. As time passed and Vulcan Fury slowly took shape, Interplay pushed the release date later and later, but never far enough to be realistically achievable. The game missed one deadline after another. Eighteen months after the E3 unveiling and four years into development, faced with an expensive project that showed no sign of being finished anytime soon, Interplay cancelled Vulcan Fury and laid off nearly the whole team. A few were reassigned to work on the sequel to Starfleet Academy, Klingon Academy, a game which would have a tumultuous development of its own, but many of the artists were hired by Babylon 5 FX House Foundation Imaging. Apparently, Foundation and DC Fontana pitched the Vulcan Fury project to Paramount, but that project never got off the ground. All we've ever seen of it is this gag featuring Spock reading dialogue from Goodfellas. What the f*** is so funny about me? Tell me. Tell me what's funny. As for Interplay, they'd hold out for a few more years, publishing some great games, but they never dug themselves out of their financial troubles. They were taken over by the French company Titus Software in 2001, and entered a slow, sad decline. The remaining founders quit, and the individual studios were shut down. At the time of recording, Interplay still exists, but only as an administrative entity with a handful of staff. They haven't released a game in many years and they're currently trying to find a buyer for their remaining intellectual property. But how much of Vulcan Fury was ever made? And is there any chance, however remote, that it might still see the light of day? Here's what I've been able to piece together. Besides the E3 demo, featuring a scene in which Scotty discovers a suspicious device in the engine room, many other sets and characters were modelled. Promotional materials show a number of assets, including most of the principal characters. There were animatics that stitched these assets into rough scenes, but it looks like that five-minute demo was the only chunk of assembled game. As for the script, it's unclear. This 600-page printout, dated just a few weeks before the game's cancellation, was apparently missing large parts of the story. This draft followed the decision to rewrite Captain Kirk as the continuous protagonist of the game to reduce the scope of the project. A full script may have existed before this, but material was being written and rewritten right up to the end, and it seems they never had something they were happy with. But these things could still, theoretically, be completed. The bigger question is how much voice work took place, and accounts of that are contradictory. One Interplay executive said that the whole cast recorded dialogue in the same room at the same time, but that warrants scepticism. Another claim is that the game was cancelled before any voice work was done. 
It seems plausible. If the actors had recorded dialogue, then why hadn't we heard any? But voice recording sessions did in fact take place in 1997 and 98, at least five full days. Shatner, Nimoy and Kelly recorded separately, but Takei, Duan, Nichols and Koenig recorded together. The character of Sarek was also intended to feature in the game, but actor Mark Lennard passed away in November 1996, before recording took place. DeForest Kelly's session was adjourned early, when producers grew concerned about his health, and he was not well enough to return. Interplay hired veteran voice artist Maurice LaMarche to impersonate McCoy in later sessions. These rare animatics feature the voices of Shatner and LaMarche. And flecks of Tellarite skin tissue in the knots. So Gert did use the harp string to garrote the ambassador. Pretty conclusive. And here is previously unseen video of James Doohan recording his lines. Performances were captured on video to be used as reference by the animators. Any indication of what is interfering with the door sensors? We'll have to bypass the safety circuits and trigger the door controls manually. I can't be certain, but it's likely this video shows James Doohan's final performance as Montgomery Scott. Why did this project end in failure? A number of things happened during development. Creative disagreements, changes in team leader, personality clashes, firings. And these things didn't help, but I don't think they're the root cause. Synthesized from several sources who don't all agree, here's my hypothesis for why Vulcan Fury failed. Remember the founders of Interplay? For years, these game designers and programmers ran the company with a creative mindset, producing diverse and innovative titles in-house and finding other developers doing interesting work that they could publish. But as the company expanded from a handful of employees to hundreds, and the number of games in simultaneous development rose into double digits, those founders were stretched thin. And into that space rushed the salesmen. In the mid-1990s, with the senior staff focused on keeping the lights on and trying to make the company profitable again, the marketing department was responsible for the day-to-day -day running of projects. Now, projects were greenlit only when they were deemed sure sellers, deadlines were set based on little more than wishful thinking, and artists and programmers who attempted to raise concerns were routinely overruled. This was Interplay's management culture during the production of Vulcan Fury. Nobody I talked to had a good word to say about it. But the company culture wasn't the only problem. The project had serious issues of its own. All that character dialogue that needed to be lip-synced and animated, one line at a time, Managers completely missed the fact that producing animation on that scale would be extremely laborious. The total runtime would be four to six hours, and though they hired every 3D animator they could find, Interplay was no Pixar. They were trying to make the equivalent of three Toy Stories on about 5% of the budget and with a team less than half the size. According to Brian Fargo, the animation work would have taken another three years a long way indeed from the company's public proclamations that release was mere months away. But I'm not sure Fargo even knew this at the time. The project managers knew, because the team, who fully appreciated the scale of the task, had tried to tell them. But instead of that information being passed up the chain, the team was ignored and given release date after release date that they knew could not be met. Excessive ambition, mid-level mismanagement, a company losing money, and a distracted CEO. This combination of factors made the failure of Vulcan Fury inevitable. Under better circumstances, the problems with the project might have been noticed and corrected earlier, but it's hard to see a plausible path that would have ended with the game that had been advertised being shipped. Vulcan Fury is just one story of many. You can pretty much pick a late 90s interplay game at random, and with a little digging, you're likely to find more stories of turbulent development, missed deadlines and disillusioned team members. And those are just the games that came out. A project that ran smoothly was an exception, not the rule. But despite the company's problems, one thing can't be denied. That Interplay made some great games and started the careers of a lot of good people. They may not have been the best run company in the world, but their influence on the industry today is huge. Last year was the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, and it's still a pop culture staple. A new TV series is coming this year, and there's a 14th film on the way. The appetite for the franchise shows no sign of dimming. 
but the chance of Secret of Vulcan Fury ever being released in any form is virtually nil. The rights issues are complicated, the voice work was unfinished, and several of the original series cast are no longer with us. But the final nail, according to the current owners of Interplay, is the fact that the project files no longer exist. Backup failures mean that, besides promotional materials and a few clips saved by employees for their demo reels, there's nothing left. No source code, no 3D models, no voice recordings. It's all irreversibly lost. We will never see The Secret of Vulcan Fury, and that's truly a shame, given the calibre of the talent that came together to make it. Under different circumstances, it could have been the most faithful Star Trek game ever made. But sadly, this is a voyage that the Enterprise will never take. Hi, it's me again. If this video was your kind of thing, could you do me a small favour? Please post about it, or tweet, or send the link to someone that you think might appreciate it. Sharing is really beneficial for getting retro histories out there, and that in turn will help me tell more stories about video game history. I really appreciate your help. Special thanks to Vulcan Fury team members John McGinley, Chris Borders, Russell Isler, Ken Allen, Tim Wilcox, and a couple of others who requested anonymity. The video you just watched is based in large part on the recollections and resources that these people generously shared with me, many of which have never been made public before. Thanks for watching this episode of Retro Histories. I'll see you again in the past. You know who we are? We're associates, your friends in sales. You do remember your friends in sales, don't you? Yes, I remember them. And can you tell me why they're not your friends anymore? Because we missed our ship date? Check out the big brain on Ken. <laughs>